following is brought to you by Severn Christian Church, a family church where your life matters. I'm from central Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's not important stuff. I come from a family of six children. My mother's family uh, came over from Sweden. My dad's family came over from Germany. And they moved into an area in, in Pennsylvania, Quaker Town, and they were grist millers. But they migrated to the central part of Pennsylvania and landed in the center part and became railroaders. And uh, I got interested in my ancestry a while back. And uh, our dad, we lost him in 2001. He, he had Alzheimer's. And uh, before we knew he had Alzheimer's, we just knew he was having some problems. Uh, he checked in to a VA home about an hour south of, of our hometown. And so one uh, Thanksgiving, my brother Casey and I went down, picked him up, and brought him back for Thanksgiving dinner. And I was telling Casey about friends from Alaska who had come down to visit us, and, and her ancestry is one of the signers of the Declaration, and his home was preserved over in New Jersey. And so I, Casey's our family historian, many of you know him, and so I said, just in your head, write down our, our family tree. He went back like six or seven generations, like boom, 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 boom. And so I told him that story about that lady, and he said, well, the only thing of notoriety I've found in our tree is that our great-great-grandfather's brother died in the Battle of South Mountain during the Civil War. And it's kind of cool, where our family burial grounds, my kids always got a thrill because the biggest monument in the place had their last name on it, you know? <laughs> And so we asked, I asked Dad, I said, Dad, do you remember your granddad talking about his dad, who, whose brother died in the Battle of the Civil War? Dad said, yeah. What did he say about it? He had a brother who died in the Civil War. <laughs> I had to excuse myself. <laughs> so we all enjoyed looking at our, our ancestry. Ancestry.com is, is a booming business. If you, you can type in your, and now you can, my wife tells me you can swab your mouth and send it in. They'll give you a breakdown even. So uh, the heritage. Well, I want to tell you this morning about the heritage of the Christian church. There is a heritage to it. There's an ancestry. It starts out in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus comes up to the boys uh, in the area of Caesarea Philippi. And, and he asked them, tell me, what, what are they saying on the streets? Who do people say that I am? And so they chime in, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he gets real personal with them. But who do you say, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you uh, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall, be, shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So there's a lot of confusion in this text. I don't know if you realize it or not. But this confession thing, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does that mean? Christ means the anointed one. The anointed one means the chosen one. And so Jesus is the anointed chosen one to do what? What was he chosen to do? He's chosen to save us. And so he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when, he called him, when, he, when he, we call him the Son of the living God, we make him equal with God. He is, he is God in the flesh. And then... He says, says to Peter, compliment him, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, there is a rather large religious organization that claims that Jesus built the church on Peter, and their leader is a descendant of Peter, and so the church is still built on this leader. I, can, I just don't get it how seemingly intelligent people Cannot figure this out. As simple as I am and how ignorant I am, I can get this. Now listen to this. You are Peter. The Greek word for Peter is Petros. It is in the masculine form. It means a small pebble. 
The word rock comes from the Greek word petra, which is in feminine form, which means a bedrock. They cannot mean the same thing. The rock does not refer to Peter. It refers back to Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That is the foundation of the church. Well, we see this, that, that Jesus is talking about the church coming into being. It wasn't in, it wasn't in existence yet. But in Acts chapter 2, we see it coming into to existence. In, in verses 22 to 24, uh, the boys were told to preach the gospel. And it's kind of interesting that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I think that day he did them a favor and brought the world to them. <laughs> because there, there were devout men from, from every nation under heaven uh, gathered in Jerusalem that day. And so Peter preached the gospel. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, a Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the, by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, uh, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. So the gospel was preached. And then we slip down to verse 36, uh, and, and, and he gives a lot of proof for the resurrection in between, but in verse 36 he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Did you get that? Sometimes we make a mistake and we invite people to come and make Jesus Lord of your life. <laughs> Guess what? He's already Lord of your life. You can't make him Lord of your life because he's Lord of it already. What you do when you become a Christian is you submit to the Lordship of Christ. You don't make him Lord. God already made him Lord and made him Christ. He made him, made him Savior. And so uh, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, cut to the heart, have you ever had that experience when thinking about Jesus and, and his death on the cross? Has it ever broken your heart? That's what happened to them. It should happen to us. And so they, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And just to make a long story short, Peter just told them exactly what Jesus told them to tell them. Repent, each of you. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off. That's us. <laughs> We're far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many words, and he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this, this, uh, uh, this perverse generation. You be saved. That you isn't there, but it can be assumed. You be saved. Now there's a theological thought that you have nothing to do with your salvation. God has chosen you to be saved. If you're chosen to be saved, that's it. It's a done deal. Sorry for you, but sometimes God chooses you to be lost. Now you read, probably read the same Bible I read. Do you read that God would choose people to be lost my bible says he wants everyone to come to repentance and be saved and so you have a choice over the matter see there's two sides to salvation there's god's side in which he provided us an atoning sacrifice and that's already been done god can do nothing more to save you but now it comes into your ballpark, and you have to make a decision with that information. Will you accept that sacrifice into your life? Well, there the church is established that day in verse 41. Uh, those who had received his word, there's a, there's a translation that says gladly received his word. I like that. Were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Church established. The apostles started to take that commission, that mission that Jesus gave them, very seriously. So they started in Jerusalem. 
Then they started to branch out, and they, they went up around the Mediterranean into Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And, and places where they went, and they stopped, and they gathered an audience, they established churches. And they, they would... Make, they would uh, um, would set it in order. Titus 1.5, this reason he, he told, Paul told Titus, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Now in Ephesians 4, Jesus talks about those elders as well as some others. He said uh, um, in Ephesians, uh, Paul writing to, uh, to the Ephesian church, he said he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, we'll talk about them in just a little bit, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the works of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And so the evangelists would, would uh, go around and, and, and find a group of people who, who would uh, commit to Christ and, and form them into a church and and then they would, would set it in order by having leadership in place. And so each church was overseen by local elders. Now there are some, some synonyms to the elders. And this may surprise some of you. But one of the synonyms of an elder is a pastor. Some of you may be tempted to call me a pastor. But I am not a pastor. I am not an elder. I'm an evangelist. Another synonym is a bishop, a shepherd. These are all synonymous to the word elder. And they were to oversee those Christians that are being formed into, into a church. Now let's fast forward a little bit. And at the death of the last apostle, almost immediately, churches started to leave the scriptural teaching of the church. You see, what happened was that churches began to elevate one of their elders to become the ruling elder of the church. What he said, that's what went. Eventually, all those elevated elders came together to form a council. And that council would meet to make decisions for each of the local churches. See how they departed from, from the original plan that Jesus gave? Eventually, that council elevated one of their own. And in 606 AD, a man, by the, a man by the name of Boniface proclaimed that he was the first universal bishop of the Roman church. Think about it. Here he is, a mere man, was now viewed as head of the church. What's wrong with that picture? Well, let me, t let me read for you, Colossians 1.8. Speaking of Jesus, he is also head of the body, the church. And he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Sorry, Boniface, but the church doesn't have two heads. There's just one. And that position's already taken. Sorry. But some people just don't get it. Well, from the Roman church, the Greek Orthodox uh, church broke off in 1054 AD, and from those two branches, all kinds of denominations sprung up. The Reformation movement in the early 16th century came about. Martin Luther, uh, and many of you will recall that, led a sweeping movement to reform the Catholic Church. That led to his eventual ex excommunication from the Catholic Church. But he continued his work, which led to the eventual, eventual Protestant Reformation. Now, he did a lot of good, including putting the Bible in the hands of the common people. One of the things that happened during the Reformation, Reformation movement, there used to be a large curtain that separated the people from the priest and the Bible. The Bible was behind the curtain because you, they, they felt it, that the people just it was up to them to tell them what was in there. Oh, that's nice and convenient, isn't it? <laughs> I'll tell you what it says. Don't you worry about it. And so one of the first things that the Reformation did was they tore down that curtain, symbolizing this book is for everyone. You can open it up. And they were, they were putting it into the common people's uh, 
language. I heard a story about um, a fellow that picked up an old, old Bible uh, from a yard sale or something like that. He went to his friend and he said, yeah, I got this Bible. It's a good, 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 a Gutenberg, his friend said. He said, yeah. He said, you know how valuable that is? He said, nah, some fool named Martin Luther wrote all over it. <laughs> all your perspective. Well, eventually Luther's followers protested over the unfair advantages given to the Catholics by the German authorities. So what do you think they became known as? The Protestants. I say that because if you're a part of the Christian church, you are not a Protestant. Your history goes back way farther than those protests. We already saw it. In Acts chapter 2, the first century of the, uh, of the A.D. And so, a lot of Protestant denominations sprung up. The Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Church of England. All of them coming into existence hundreds of years after Jesus established his church. Well, in the early 19th century to the early 20th century, another movement started. To advance, and it advanced to restore, not reform anything, but to restore the church as it, was, as it was found in the New Testament. And quite appropriately, it became known as the Restoration Movement. There are a lot of important people in that movement. Thomas and Alexander Campbell, um, their friend Martin W. Stone, John Raccoon John Smith, many others. And in the beginning, they didn't know each other. But they all, when they got together, they, they realized they had a common uh, desire to, to know God's word and a common respect for the Bible as the word of God. And so they started to encourage the abandoning of party names and, and denominational names and creeds and simply go with the Bible, particularly the New Testament. And so unlike Luther and Calvin and Wesley, whose works resulted in new denominations, These men simply pointed people to the New Testament scriptures and the church that Jesus built. Folks, that's our heritage. That's where we came from. And there's a lot of famous slogans that came into being. For instance, uh, one of them was, we have no creed but Christ. And so what was happening was they they were forming these little documents or statements or whatever that kind of sums up biblical teaching, but people were paying more attention to the creeds than they were the Bible. And so these, these wise Restoration Fathers said, let's get rid of these creeds. Let's just go back to the Bible and, uh, and see what the Bible, Bible says. We're not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. Interesting, huh? We are Christians only. I don't mean to hurt you, I don't want to insult you in any way, and please don't take it this way. Let me do a little experiment first. I'm going to count to three. And uh, when I say three, I want you to, to say what religious group you have come to the Christian church from. All right, so if you came from... The Catholic Church, you, you say Catholic, or you came from the Methodist Church, Methodist or Baptist. Okay, you get, you get that? All right, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right, now on three, I want everybody to say Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. Oh, that's easier to understand, isn't it? What do you call people that go to a Catholic church? A Catholic. What do you call people that go to a Baptist church? A Baptist. What do you call people that go to a Methodist church? A Methodist. What do you call people that go to a Christian church? How novel. A Christian. Simply a Christian. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. In other words... If we're going to tell you something you absolutely need in your life, we're going to show it to you in the Bible. If we can't find it in the Bible, we might have an opinion about it, but you're certainly not obligated to abide by our opinions. 
You see that? Where scriptures speak, we speak. Where scriptures are silent, we're silent. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials or opinions, liberty. But in all things, love. So now we get to Severn Christian Church. Began in Glen Burnie. And with Gary Sirago as the evangelist, the church was able to secure this beautiful property, build the first phase of this beautiful uh, facility. And uh, I believe when, when Sirago started, he was still in Bible college. And when he came, he may have been the only one on staff. And today, the, I believe uh, this church has four staff members. They have a couple of vacancies. But I want you to remember something, that the Lord has called some to be preachers, some to be evangelists, some to be elders or pastors. But, but the Severn Christian Church is a church that is in order. It has a functioning eldership that's been taking care of the Lord's business for a long time. And so uh, you just said goodbye to, to one of your, your staff members. And, and so you're looking to, uh, to complete your leadership team. But I want to encourage you to be faithful and to base your faith on no man. <laughs> Don't base your faith on an evangelist. Don't base your faith on an elder, but on the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep him central. Some people will say, well, well what you, can you show me your statement of faith? I want to throw the Bible at them. This is it, you know. We, we don't have it. The New Testament, you know, what do you want from me? Uh, and uh, again, the leadership of the church, uh, as we already said, Jesus is the only head. And we, we looked at Ephesians 4. And I, I think in that Ephesians 4 passage there are two temporary offices and two ongoing offices there are no apostles of christ regardless of what the church of the latter-day saints says there are no apostles for the simple reason there's no one old enough you see to be an apostle you had to be with jesus from his baptism to his ascension Uh, now there's some old people but nobody's that old all right and there's no prophets as, as they were in the New Testament. Why don't we have prophets? Because we have the Bible. The prophets gave God's message as the Bible was being formed, as, as God was giving his word. But now that we have the complete New Testament, the prophets are no longer. But there are evangelists and there are pastor teachers. The evangelist is one who is sent to preach and teach. And the pastor teacher i think are one and the same the leaders of the local church but the verse i want you to see is in verse 12 it is the purpose or the work of the church leaders why did god give us leaders to equip god's people for works of service notice it says nothing about forming policy it's all about equipping the saints for works of service what is our mission Well, Matthew 28, 18 to 20 gives it very clearly. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. There it is. Any church that is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ has this very same mission. To make disciples of Jesus Christ. And once they are followers, we baptize them. Once they commit to following, we baptize them. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe or obey all that I command you. Don't do, just don't teach them what he said to teach them. Teach them how to obey what he taught. And he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So, equipping saints to make disciples. Here's my view. The mission is, is, is given to us by the Lord himself. The vision is a picture of success. How do we know we're making disciples of Jesus Christ? I think that's a vision. When we equip people to make disciples, when they, are in the, when they have the ability to reproduce Christ who is in them and someone else, they have become a disciple of Jesus. Because the word disciple is mathetes. It means a witnessing learner. And so until you witness, until you are a witness of what you have learned, until you have spread the faith along, until you have reproduced, uh, you may, you're not a mathetes. True disciples reproduce Christ 
uh, who is in them and others. And so, and then we get into a strategy or a practice. Uh, what's the strategy? Well, um, Clyde gave me this, uh, this about four, about eight or nine pages called Vision 2016-2020, uh, and it has eight practices of South uh, Severn Christian Church. And so it, 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 it's a step-by-step -step of how we are accomplishing our, our vision that leads to the fulfillment of our mission. And so there's all kinds of things. You can read this, and, and it would take a long time for, uh, to do that. But, but just we've seen what we're doing. We have corporate worship on Sunday. There's Bible studies going on. There's discipleship development. There's small groups. There's programs for, uh, for babies clear up to, uh, uh, to teenagers and, and beyond. Serving the community, serving the country, serving the world, uh, the missions program. And so we should continue to try to expand into our, our community. See, there's a, um, there's a great gulf between the church and the culture. And so it's our job to build a bridge into the culture so that people can find their way to the Lord. Now, how's the best way to build that bridge? The best way to build that bridge is to serve to serve our community, to get out into our community and make a difference. We want to help people to get to know Jesus and then help them grow in them. So we ought to have an environment on Sunday that's, that's comfortable for guests to come into regularly. From an initial attendance, they ought to be encouraged to be involved in a Bible study uh, to begin growing spiritually, maybe in a small group. Get them in the word so that they can grow. And so we make disciples of Jesus Christ through a, prog a program of equipping the disciples to reproduce. Equipping saints to make disciples. So how about you and the Christian church? Here's how it comes down. To be in part of the Christian church, you must first <laughs> follow Jesus. And I want to tell you, it's very easy to follow Jesus if you don't follow him very far. But as you follow him more in depth, you see, it's kind of an inverted corporate ladder. And corporate, the corporate ladder, the higher you go, the more perks you get, right? And the spiritual ladder, the higher you go, the less perks you get. Because <laughs> you're a servant. You learn to be a servant of all. In the Christian church, plug into a ministry, talk up Jesus, connect to a small group, serve in the community, pray regularly for this church, and give. Give of your time, give of your talent, give of your treasures, give of your testimony. Tell people about him. And if you're not a, a, a member of the Christian church, I would encourage you to become a member of the Christian church. And you see, you can't join, sorry. There's no joining the church. Because what people, what Jesus has said was you get people to come to faith in him. Faith in what? That he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that faith has an impact on our way of thinking. It changes our mind. Because where we used to serve the law of sin, we realize we don't want to do that anymore. And the Bible gives that the name repentance. So we turn away from sin and we turn to God. And in a very real way, spiritually, we die that day. <laughs> we die to an old way of life. That's why we are buried. And we are buried in the waters of baptism. And in that, in that water, something fantastic happens. Many things happen, actually. But one of the greatest things that happens in that baptistry is that God becomes the surgeon. 
and he cuts away that old person of sin and leaves it there. And so when people say, well, when you preach that baptism is essential for your salvation, you're preaching salvation by works. And I'll say, guilty is charged. But it's God's work. It's not your work. It's not my work. It's God's work. Colossians 2.12 tells us that about our faith in the working of God when we're baptized. And so when we're baptized into Christ, Our sins are forgiven. And so that God doesn't want to leave a void in our life, he gives us the gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And he's there for a very important purpose. And it's not to give you the warm feelings or the the excited feelings or the desire to jump over rows of chairs and excitement for the Lord, that's not the Holy Spirit's purpose. The Holy Spirit is trying to make you as much like Jesus as he, as he possibly can. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes in. And another thing that God does in that baptistry is that he takes you out of One of two universal kingdoms. He takes you out of one and puts you in the other. You see, the two universal kingdoms are the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of God. And when we're baptized, God translates us. He takes us out of that dark kingdom and plants us firmly in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his son. Now, Some of you are thinking... Just a second, preacher. So you're telling me that if I'm not a Christian, I'm in the kingdom of God's enemy? I'm not actually saying that. I think God said that. You can only be in one of two kingdoms. So you're either in the kingdom of God or you're in the kingdom of God's enemy. That's the choice you have. And God has the ability when he sees your faith and he knows that you have repented of your sins and you are baptized into Jesus Christ, he puts you in his kingdom, the church. I don't know where you're at in that process. But the band's going to come and lead us in in a song, and I think uh, it'd be quite appropriate if you, if you need to confess your faith in Christ. Having made a repentant decision, you need to be baptized. That can happen right now, right now. So if you need to do that, come forward. Someone will meet you here and take you through that uh, process. But would you pray with me before the band sings? Father, thank you so much for your church. Oh, how we love the church because we know it is the only institution that has an eternal purpose. And so, Father, I pray uh, for this congregation that it will always be faithful uh, to what you have written in your word. But now, God, at this time, we just pray for those that, that aren't in a relationship with you, that today would be the day. Today is the day of salvation. May this be the day for them that they would give their lives back to a loving Father who created them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.